What is up y'all and welcome back to the channel. Today we've got the start of a series that I'm very, very excited to bring y'all as, as always. We're, we're always excited on this channel. Um, even when I'm feeling kind of tired, maybe getting a little sick, not sure. Um, but I've been doing a, a bit of like deck consulting uh, with the new Discord and definitely click that link below if you haven't done that to join our community. Um, we're, we have so many exciting things going on, um, a lot of expansion within the channel, and we're just, you know, really trying to grow the community and what we can do together. So definitely a shout out to uh, the folks over there. So one of the things I've been doing as someone who's really involved with the Discord is, you know, just kind of tuning in when people are like, hey, you know, I don't know how to build this deck or like this is a deck or a Planeswalker that I really want to play. I've had some success, but I, I feel like there's stuff I can do better. So we haven't done a series like this on the channel, and I figured today we would start off with how to build aggro. And I will be the first to say that as a Magic the Gathering player, I started out as a control player and then very much grew fond of aggro. Um, and I was very excited to play it uh, when I first started in the game, and then I've sort of like gone to different decks, you know, depending on what the meta is. Um, but it occurred to me that, you know, whether you haven't played a bunch of Magic the Gathering like I have, or just a bunch of other card games, and you're like, well, I know what aggro's supposed to do, but when I'm just building decks, like, what does that look like? And I think getting in this Planeswalker and this deck is a really good example of what a, like, very standard aggro deck is trying to do, right? Of course, he has this different signature ability and signature cards than other aggressive Planeswalkers, but I just felt like this archetype um, is really just, you know, encapsulated by what Gideon was trying to do. It felt like he was one of the better examples to talk about what it means to build an aggro deck. And I think we will touch on at least three total Planeswalkers because I don't want to just say blankets like this is how you build every single aggro deck. There are commonalities. Um, you're going to see some of them right up front. Um, but... And, and so it's important for us to be able to have like a nuanced take and say, okay, this might be good for Gideon's strategy. This might not be so good for Chandra's strategy uh, because they're kind of doing different things. Yes, they're applying pressure, but are they applying pressure in the same way? And I would argue when we look at Gideon, Chandra, and Driz today, because I think they hit a nice little cross, cross section of what aggressive decks can look like, they're all pressuring, but through different means. And so that is going to mean that your deck needs to be built a certain way. Um, so let me know what you guys think of these kind of videos. Like, if it feels like I'm repeating myself, if it feels like, you know, it's not as helpful, do let me know. Like, do let me know what would be more helpful. Um, but if this is the kind of stuff that you like, like kind of like the, the theory of deck building and those kind of deep dives, then I am happy to do more. Um, so let's kick it off with what I call the classic, which is just one of the best Gideon decks that kind of was around. I'm sure you could make some tweaks to it, but this used to rule the meta as one of the best aggressive decks. And then they nerfed Gideon from a 4-4 to a 3-3, and you know he really could use some love, um, and it's kind of struggling. But I still think if you fired up this deck in the meta right now, it would still be able to get you some wins, and I think it would do pretty well. Why is that? So. We can't talk about how to build this deck without talking about Gideon, right? So lead the charge. After you attack with three or more creatures, summon Gideon, right? Who's a 3-3 indestructible, right? Like, can't take damage. Um, and then we've got our signature cards, right? But yeah, 3-3 three, three invulnerable, can't trigger traps. Definitely very relevant, right? So, like, when they're blocking him, um, you know, like, there's no traps that are going to hit him on the backside, right? Like, it's... It is important when you're blocking Gideon to know that he's not going to trigger the traps that you want. So you're going to have to block other creatures. So when you read this, right, you should already be thinking, okay, the best way for me to apply pressure playing aggressive Gideon is to have at least three creatures on the board as much as humanly possible, right? Any way that I can do that, that's what I should be doing to enable my passive Gideon to come out, right? Um... We can get into some of the nitty gritty, but I'm really gonna try and stick to some of the broader concepts. So, when you look at this deck, what's something that 
you probably notice. Wow, there are a lot of one drops. We've got Oath of the Paladin, Thraben Sentry, Fledgling Griff, Elite Vanguard, Arden Supporter, the one of Gideon Protector Protection, I'll explain why. Right? There's a lot that we're doing on one. Why? Because we need to have a creature played every single turn. Right? If we if we want to have the best shot of hitting that three creature threshold to get our, our free three three creature. And for those of you who don't know, if you have a full board of five creatures, you still get Gideon, right? Uh, same with Guedevar for um, Drist, right? Like, it, it counts as a sixth creature, which can be incredibly powerful, right? Like, your opponent can only play five creatures, right, if they're not playing the same Planeswalker. So you're essentially getting an absolute free, like, continual attacker, even if your whole board is full, right? So... What that means is you want to have cheap creatures that you're playing out on turn one. I will say, as a relative blanket statement, if you were playing an aggressive deck, the best possible draw you can have, for the most part, in a vacuum, is three one drops, right? Why? Turn one, you got a one drop. Turn two, you play two one drops. Magic number, <laughs> three. Um, so... When you go Oath of the Paladin into Thraben Century Fledgling Griff, that following turn, you're attacking with Gideon, right? Um, same thing with you play these other one drops, aside from Gideon's protection. So you just want to think, okay, my Planeswalker is requiring me to have as many creatures on the board as possible. There are ways to punish that, definitely, we'll talk about that. But how do I enable that, right? And so then it's really just picking what one drops do you want to play? Arden Supporter, no-brainer, right? It's a 2-1 one for 1. Used to be a 1-1. One, one. They buffed it, which I think was definitely correct. Um, I still love this Go Gideon poster. <laughs> it's so great. Um, so it's a 2-1 that makes another creature with uh, cost 2 or less. Awesome. Just like straight-up card value. Elite Vanguard, 1 mana, 3-1. Great. It's going to trade for whatever. If it doesn't, it hits their face. It hurts a lot. Fledgling Griff, 1-2 Flyer for 1 right it's really easy for this to connect in the air and flyers in particular right if we're talking about keeping creatures that stay on the board and attack through you want evasive creatures too right like not just having ground creatures right or like thraven century which has armor you're gonna need some creatures that can go over your opponent to some degree right maybe not in all builds right and you can maybe play with like a gideon flyer build but at the end of the day you might want to have some evasive creatures. Real quick aside, Gideon's Protection. I've always found one Gideon's Protection to be good, right? And then the second one, not so much. Um, what this essentially says is sorcery, right? It says give a friendly creature armor and give Gideon plus one, plus one. You can, this is not a trap, right? So you just play this and it happens. And let me tell you, telegraphing where your armor is going onto a creature, not good, right? The payoff here is that your Gideon's becoming a 4-4 four, four for the rest of the game. So playing one, I think it's fine. I don't think I would play more than that. It's just not that powerful a card. So that's something we can also talk about is card evaluation. Like it takes a little bit, but basically you just want to think about like, okay, if I draw one, how do I feel? If I draw two, how do I feel? And the answer is, I think you're gonna feel pretty bad if you draw two of this card. Now I'm not gonna to get too much into the splash because you know, that's like finer deck building details. But let's just talk about the curve of the deck, right? Like when we look at these numbers on the side, right? We've got a bunch of one drops. Then there's a little bit of a dip, two drops, three drops, no four drops. I think that was just because I was testing some stuff here. You could play Dungeon Geist, potentially. And then we've got a couple five drops, right? No six, no seven, no eight, nothing bigger, right? And that's also being mindful that starting on turn five, right, so you can only have four mana and this will go off, you're going to have a chance to get a random white creature. So you also want to be considering when your land is going off, like the earliest, if that's going to be disruptive to what you're doing. But this deck is, aside from four cards, right, it's all three mana or under. And I don't know that everyone will see this and immediately think, oh, I think that's how you build it. But that is really what you want to do. You just want to have, be having the most mana efficient turns. And when you have also mana constrictors and one drop two, almost forgot him, 
Um, you know, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven things to do on turn one. And you've got one, two, three, four, five, five, two drops, right? Negates don't really count because you're not curving them out as creatures. And then you've got two Paragon, two Raise the Guard, which essentially is build your own Gideon, right? At the end of your opponent's turn, you get three soldiers. So I was testing this. I'm not entirely sure if it's the best card, but thought it was interesting. Stoneforge, just kind of an always auto-include in, in white aggressive and mirroring strategies. And then Geist, which I thought was like, you know, card advantage, right? You play a 3-2, you get a 4-3 flyer. If you get to resolve it right before Geist dies, Geist gets a uh, armor token. Pretty nice. Um, I won't get to these yet. So just take note, right? Like, it's just when you're playing aggressive strategies, you need to be cheaper than your opponent, right? If they're taking time to set up these strong, powerful strategies, epitome of might, a 10 drop, right? Lava wave, an 8 drop. You have to be faster. And the only way you can get faster in card games, right, is through mana cost. And so you want to just play the most bang for your buck at the cheapest rate. And, you know, for card evaluation, it takes a little bit of time, like I said, to really get good at that. But over time, you will just be able to say, okay, having a 2-2 two -two for 2 that buffs another creature, that's good for my Iowa deck, right? That's good enough. Um, you know, having a 1-3 flyer that's not going to die to some sort of removal and connects and make sure my Gideon gets on board, that's good enough, right? It'll take a bit of time to, to figure that out. But, so this, this is a deck, like an actual deck that I could fire up and play on the ladder. But just for the sake of example, because I was working with someone, shout out to Ben on Discord. <laughs> I forget if there was another name. Um, they were kind of playing around with what they had you know, and splashing green and seeing how that went. And one of the first things I said was, all right, you got to make sure you've got a low curve, right? I forget the exact deck that Ben had linked me. Um, but, you know, one of the first things I was like is like, all right, you can play Spirit, you can play Griff, Vanguard, uh, Ardent Supporter. Uh, you can put some some little combat tricks and Untested Rookie, right? It's So it's, it's functioning the same way, right? We don't have anything past five, right? We've only got four kind of quote end game cards right and then the rest is very low cost very cheap and efficient so wh what i think i wanted to highlight here is like just because you don't have a meta deck doesn't mean that you can't build a functional build right as long as you're following the same deck building rules you can get very very close because you're still enabling your deck to do a very similar thing, maybe not quite as powerful or quite as efficient, but you're like very much like in the upper percentile for success. Um, so I would just say if you have a Gideon build, you build you put on the shelf and you're like, this Planeswalker's not good. I don't know how to make this work. Look, if you're feeling like you want to do it or you're a Gideon fan and you've been struggling, this is how you do it. You just, whether it's, I'm not going to put the deck codes in, in the bottom, like, feel free to add them to the, you know, um, just by looking at the videos, just because I don't want you to just copy and paste these decks. I'm not saying these are the best decks to play, I'm not saying these are the best builds of Gideon, but what I am trying to offer up is just, you want to think about cheapness, you want to think about just your overall curve and how you're getting cards on the board, and you want to think about how you're ending the game. So. When it comes to ending the game, and why I really like, quote, the classic deck here, is the interaction, and I've said this before, but for those who have not played a ton of white, you might not know about this, is between Oath of the Paladin and Fair Fight. So, Oath of the Paladin. You get a 1-2, cool, gives a little buff. You get Divine Smite, a little removal spell. And you get Aura of Courage, right? Which is a very, very powerful spell. Um... Regardless of what the meta is right now, this card on paper is going to win you games if you're ahead, right? It may not win you games if you're super behind, and it will also win you games when you're even. So what Aura of Curse says is for the rest of the game, after a friendly creature attacks, give it plus one, plus one. Okay, what is the most powerful end game we can have for Gideon, right? It's making sure that our cheap little creatures, some have armor, some have flying, some have high power, right? Some are just efficient. Um, some have other evasion, right? We want to make sure that we're getting, like I said, the most bang for your buck. 
So Oath of the Paladin is going to buff your cheap creatures to be more more strong, right? Even if you go raise the guard into Aura of Courage, right? You just made three two twos for three mana, right? Um, and then the other ones that survive, if they get one or two blocks off, it's going to get bigger next turn. But Aura of Courage is specifically very good with Fair Fight, because what this card does, no matter how big your opponent's creatures are, right? It shrinks them down to a 4-4. They keep their other stats, right, or, or other keywords and stuff like that. But, as you can see, this mouse becomes as big as this elephant, right? So it's just the perfect way to talk about Gideon because Gideon is kind of that mice that's getting in that early damage, right, trying to bug that elephant. Um, but then you need something to even the odds. And so what Fair Fight allows you to do after you have cast Aura of Courage right is everything on the battlefield becomes a four four and then when you attack all of your creatures become five fives right so your opponent cannot trade for any of your creatures it is straight up they are chump blocking each one and so minimum what you're able to do is trade off for some of their creatures where you just straight up get a one for zero right you get to kill their creature you get to keep yours so this is why I had originally wanted to play this deck. Shout out to Buxfu and Beyond Bounds, to OG MTG SS uh, Clan spell you know spell slingers. Um, they have pioneered this kind of build, and I just feel like if you ever try this, like it is really really strong when you get it. Um, so I think it's probably one of the best, if not the best, late game for Gideon because you're not only buffing your creatures up you're shrinking your opponent's creatures down. And that can be really, really powerful. Paragon of Balance does an impression of that, right, by setting the power of all other creatures to their current health, right? So you've got a 0-3 for armor, it becomes a 3-3 three, three with armor. You've got a 1-2 flyer, it becomes a 2-2 two, two flyer, right? Um, you've got a 1-3 flyer, it becomes a 3-3 three, three flyer, right? So you can kind of see, like, what we're doing with this deck, right? So I think it's really fun to play. Feel free to play it. But at the end of the day, just think about what you're doing at all points in the game. In the early game, you're trying to get those three creatures on the board. You're trying to continue deploying threats that are going to connect. You maybe got a little interaction, right, with the game. Or you're slowing them down with Mana Constrictor. Then you've got Paragon of Balance, Raise the Guard, Stoneforge Mystic to get some more card advantage going, right? And then you've got a, a really fun combo with Sylvia Brightspear, right? You can set the health of each creature to one and then slam your Paragon of Balance the next turn. <laughs> and that means they all become 1-1s. One so it's a fun little combo. And then Captain of the Guard I actually really liked. Still don't know if it's like top tier, but you know, getting spotted a free soldier when you miracle it is pretty nice. It's a 4-6, so it plays nicely with Paragon of Balance, right? Making it into a 6-6. Six, six. Um, and you know, when you attack with it, right, you get a soldier. So I mean, really what you want to do with Gideon is just, just have so many bodies on the board that you just continue to make Gideon over and over again. You're just getting more and more card advantage. And when you play against Gideon, you basically never want to block him until you have to, right? Because he's just free damage on your creatures, freely killing your creatures. So again, just to kind of recap, right? We need to be really mindful of our curve and what we're doing at the early, mid, and late game, right? And so that's... Gideon. So, moving right along, we gotta talk about Chandra, and I'm gonna leave this build up for now while I take a quick su swig of water. So, I don't think that this is the best Chandra build, something I was playing around with, but I wanted to talk about what does an aggro deck look like when you're not necessarily trying to win through creatures, right, and you're just trying to win through damage. Right? Because what Chandra does, she deals 5 damage to your opponent at the beginning of the game. Right, So they're starting with 5 less life. And what does Chandra have? She's got her signature, you know, or it's not a signature card technically, but a card that obviously she would be using. Lava Axe, where you're dealing 5 damage. You've got Flame Shot, right, to deal 3 damage if you want to, plus 1 to other enemies. You've got Shock to deal 2 damage. You've got Hell Rider which can potentially deal direct damage. So this is this deck is going to operate differently, right? We have different deck building rules. This does not need to have three creatures on the board at all time, 
really all it needs to do is connect for damage, because the lower your opponent's life total is, the easier it is to kill them with Lava Axe. So the way you build this aggro deck is going to be a combination of spells and cheap creatures, and cheap creatures that you're hoping to connect for damage as quickly as possible, right? And that's why you would play something like Siren Prowler. It's not a powerful card, but what it does allow you to do is guarantee two damage to your opponent. They cannot block the first sneak attack, right? Um, same thing with cards like Burn Through, right? You're dealing one damage, which isn't a lot, but the trade-off is that you're allowing your creatures to go through, right? So that that creature can't block your creature. You've got Pouncing Lemur, which if it connects early on, right, it's dealing three damage for one mana. Great raid. You've got Raging Goblin. If that's your turn one play, and you're on the you're the player going first, right? That's a guaranteed two damage. They don't have anything that can stop that. So you can already kind of see that this deck is operating on a bit of a different axis, which is it's not necessarily about just pooping out a bunch of creatures immediately. It's really about what are the creatures that are going to connect for damage most of the time, right? Like Gideon's not necessarily about damage per se. It's more about like making sure your creatures survive or having enough gas to keep attacking with Gideon. Whereas with Chandra, they've dealt five damage at the beginning of the game. Your job is just to get that to zero, right? And so you've got Shock that also contributes to that. Again, if we look at this curve, right, nothing over five, right? And the earliest Ember Spawn Crags can do is starting turn five, right? These, these are specific deck choices that I've made to make the deck as efficient as possible so that every game that I'm playing, if all goes, if all fails, right, I'm still going to have what I need to do on the right curve at the right time, right? So we've got our one drop suite, and then we've got quite a few two drops, Elemental, Short Cutter, Takedown, and Rage Runner. Rage Runner and Elemental, if they connect for damage, it's going to hurt. Goblin Short Cutter, it's a body that allows you to connect for damage, right? And then Takedown just sometimes can be a very efficient removal spell. We're living in a meta of Jiraga Druid, right? It's a 3-4 three, for 3 mana. Takedown kills that, right? You, know, you don't have to worry about dealing 4 damage to it. It just destroys that creature. So that was just a, a deck choice I've been thinking about. And then we get to some other ways to deal damage. Ball of Light, right? This card's going to die at the end of turn, but it's got 6 power, it's got Trample, it's got Haste. So you'll often see Chandra playing Haste creatures, right? Let's say Minotaur, Raging Goblin. I was trying Electro Alchemist. Not sure it's that good, but was giving it a shot, right? And so what this what this means, right, is you're just trying to like jump ahead of your opponent to connect for damage to close out the game, right? And then you've only got three five cost spells on the top, so it looks different than Gideon, right? You're playing a straight up different Planeswalker, um, but. Similar to Angrath, who I think is kind of analogous to what Chandra's doing, you're just trying to get damage through to get to your spells that close out the game, right? Um, so again, you need to be having a plan turns 1 through 3, turns 2 through 4, 5, and then turns 5 through 8, right? Like, I don't know what the average turn length in the game is. I would be interested to see that um, with, with the meta right now. But you just want to kind of think about it as in chunks, right? You play your one drop, then you play two one drops, or you play a two drop, then you play your three drop, then maybe you, you know, play your flame shot or your lava axe ahead of curve, then you play your flame shot, right? It's just, you want to be thinking about what you're doing kind of at all points in the game, no matter what. And aggro, again, it's cheap, it's efficient, and it's trying to get underneath your opponent's defenses before they have time to get those shields up, right? Before they can get their life total up. Deal with your threats, right? So that's really how Chandra is functioning. Now, I would say the most different approach, although there are some similarities, is going to be Drist. And I will admit freely, I have not played Drist in quite a long time. So take this build with a grain of salt. So, for this aggro deck, and I would also kind of qualify him in the aggro decks that scale up, because he's not, he's not really just doing kind of this flat power level thing, right? You have, you have Guanavar, right? It starts out as a 0-2 when you attack with a legendary creature, it gets one more attack, right? And it used to have Trample, <laughs> and that was the Drizzt meta, because that was incredibly powerful, um... 
but but like Gideon, right? There's there are some similarities, right? You're getting spotted a free creature that's going to keep coming back, keep beating your opponent down, and becoming a problem. And what's different, right, is that Guinevar doesn't start out at three power like Gideon, but can obviously exceed that. And so Drizzt just tends to scale better, right? Its creatures just continually get stronger over the course of the game. And that's why Drizzt can also be just a really good option for certain metas as an aggro deck, because he can tussle with the other aggro decks, but he he has better late game because his creatures are scaling up or his Guinevar is scaling up. So again, we're going to look at a curve that's relatively low, right? We've only got one five drop, we've got two four drops, so... Like I said, there are some glaring similarities, and the similarity is cheap. <laughs> That's the similarity. And with Moreland Haunt going off as early as turn 6, right, it's perfect. Because if you do everything through turn 1 through 5, turn 6, this is not going to disrupt what you're doing. Because the highest mana cost thing you can have in your hand is Ulrich. So I just tend to enjoy building decks that way. Because yes, there's a trade-off, where if your land goes off earlier, like, you know, uh, maybe it's still good enough. But I kind of want to make it so that whenever my land goes off, it's the if it's the earliest as possible, it's still going to allow me to play the game how I want to. Right? I'm not going to have to sort of deal with the awkwardness. That's why in Nyssa, when I run Woodland Hermitage, I do accept that I might lose like 1% of my games to getting Woodland Hermitage on turn 5 and 6, right? which has happened to me. <laughs> but for the most part, I'm generating mana at such a rate that it will never matter. Um, and so that's, that's, that is kind of a different style from what I'm doing here. So what do you need to do with Drist? You need to attack with legendary creatures, right? This is not going to be for the budget players. This is not going to be for the new players. Sorry. You're going to need to craft specific legendary cards. And that's usually not doable when you first start the game. But when you accrue them over, over time, like Drist can be a really fun option. You do need to set it up, though. You need cards that can buff things, like Invoked it on. You need Daughter of Rune putting armor on a legendary creature, right? It's going to mean that your creature gets to attack twice. That means two times the power for Gwenevar, right? Um, and, and I've got some, like, other specific interactions, but essentially you want to look at this as, I want to play a legendary on turn one. Okay, my options are Matron of Malice and Pure the Dreamer. I want to play a legendary on turn two. You know you, right? Except, usually, you can just, like, play this on turn 3, 4, 5, whatever. It's going to be really, really good. Um, Haste Trample gets really big. Very powerful. Okay, I want to keep doing that. I've got Drizzt Herald, right? Turn something into a Legendary. All right, I want to keep applying pressure. I've got the best Haste Legendaries I can. Zozu, Tajik, Ulrich. Ulrich being the best. Um, so, it's really clear what you're doing here, right? You're just trying to play... An attack with a legendary at every single point every single turn in the game if you could do that you're gonna win the game right like I think I would say that the games that Drist will win the most is a turn one malice or a turn one pure the dreamer it's just you're gonna be able to get the ball rolling and you're gonna accrue the advantage um, you know with your legendary creatures if you have certain cards in your build um, this is an old build it might function okay I think I would probably want to tweak it but really, the deck building rules here are play as many legendaries as you can. Right? So we got Matron, Pier, Yinogu, uh, Ulrich, Taijik, Zozu. Right? And there's I actually have a different build here, right? From Shout Out to Zarashi, who made top 100 this month and uh, also was just the absolute Drizz prodigy. You could also play Zinderspill, right? That's another two cost legendary. Um, and there are some other options, right? For different cards that you can prioritize but basically with Drist you just want to make sure you've got a pretty nice kind of cross section of either I would say ideally haste legendaries right so they come in get that attack get Guanabara rolling or they're just cheap and efficient right like Matron of Malice and Pure the Dreamer so those are like the biggest deck constraints for him uh, you still want to have just like cheap creatures that are interacting pushing damage allowing you to fight things, uh, turning into a legendary so that you can punch through damage. Uh, Birds of Paradise into Drist Herald used to be one of the best curves. I still think that could be very good, right? Because you're just going to get that free attack with your Birds of Paradise. Most people are not going to have something that can deal with a flyer that early. 
right? And then maybe you throw in some interaction, some removal, right? Armadillo Cloak actually used to be pretty good whenever I played it, right? Just healing one of your legendaries to full and getting a plus two, plus two just tends to be pretty backbreaking. Um, so Drist is, there's not a lot to talk about here. I think, again, you know, this is not going to be accessible to everyone because you need to have legendaries and legendaries cost a lot of gems, um, you know, a lot of materials. So that can be really tough. But I didn't want to just be like, all right, put a bunch of aggro creatures in Drizzt. It's all going to work out. No, it will not work out. You need, so how many legendaries? You got one, two, three, four, five, six, right? Um, and we're hopefully giving those legendaries armor. We're beefing them up with Invoke the Dawn. We're beefing them up with Elvish Infuser. We're clearing the way with Grudge Mesh. We're making more legendaries with Drizzt Herald. We're getting a, a, a legendary off of Hero's Call, right? Um, we're buffing them up with Stoneforge Mystic. So this deck is, I would say, the least new player friendly. Um, but when you get to this point, this is kind of how you would want to think about constructing the deck. Um, there are some choices like Traveler Supplies and Alarm Bell. I've just been really partial to that sort of combo um, with Drist because what Traveler Supplies is just cheap and efficient. It's going to make your legendaries come down with more stats which just makes them obviously more powerful. Alarm Bell gives us a shot, right? When it was drafted, it was even better for the deck, but it still gives us a shot at here hitting Pure the Dreamer, Matron of Malice, or Yanogu early on, right? And also, Tarnagriff gets pretty big in decks like this. You've got Alarm Bell, you've got Travel Supplies, you've got Creatures, you've got Spells. So even if you grab, like, a Tarnagriff off of uh, Alarm Bell, not the end of the world. So, um, like I said, don't want to get too caught up in the nitty gritty of the deck. Um, but this definitely Drist is an aggro deck that scales up, that has kind of different deck building rules. But again, we're looking at sort of cheap, efficient aggro decks, right? So that's kind of where I would like for us to end today. Um, we could do even deeper dives, <laughs> definitely on some of the decks, but that is aggro. Right? I would say the tenants are cheap, efficient, and, I don't know, curve, like just making sure your curve is good, right? It's like having a concentration of one drops, two drops, three drops, and a little sprinkling of four and five. Um, those are really the tenants of aggro decks. It does depend on the spell slinger that you're choosing, right? You need to enable what their strategy is telling you. Um, so you've got Gideon, got to have a lot of creatures on the board. Chandra, you gotta push that damage. And Drist, you gotta have some legendary creatures to punch through to beef up your nice little panther friend. Um, so that is it for today, folks. I think we'll try and get out a video for mid-range and control, and maybe I'll try and talk about like what combo looks like, even though there aren't too many options in the game. Um, but let me know if this would be helpful, like doing this video series, um, and or doing other video series that do a little bit more of this like Kind of archetype dive right where you're kind of looking at a, a different section of decks or like ways of deck building i have a lot of fun with that as you can probably tell um so i'm gonna leave it there and uh thank you all for watching please join our discord um we'd love to have you uh we'd love to talk shop and uh plan different events and all that good stuff so until next time take it easy